experts on hate, experts on extremism, civil rights leaders. Whenever journalists mention the Anti-Defamation League, they are always referred to as one or more of the above. The Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, or ADL for short, has long been thought of as the organization leading the fight to eradicate anti-Semitism and hate. But perception, especially mass media-induced perception, is not always reality. For there is another side to the ADL, a darker, more sinister side. The ADL itself was established in 1913 by a lawyer named Sigmund Livingston, who began with, quote, two desks, $200, and the sponsorship of the Independent Order of B'nai B'rith, close quote, an international Jewish fraternal organization founded in the 19th century. The establishment of the ADL was in response to the hanging of Leo Frank. Between April 26 and 27, 1913, Leo Frank raped and killed a little girl named Mary Fagan. There was a great deal of publicity about the case at the time, and ultimately, Frank was sentenced to death for this heinous crime. However, the Georgia governor, John Slayton, in his last day of office, commuted Frank's death sentence after a great deal of behind-the-scenes dealing. This absolute corruption enraged the locals so much that they took Frank and hung him themselves. The ADL's goal was to provide a counter to any extant anti-Jewish feeling in order to prevent vigilantism of a similar nature in the future, and in its own words become, quote, the nation's foremost champion in the struggle against anti-Semitism, close quote. Since then it has grown into a national nonprofit organization that took in $46 million in revenues in 1998 and employs 200 people into New York headquarters alone. The ADL is commonly known as a civil rights organization, fighting for the well-being of all individuals, Jews and Gentiles alike. The ADL itself states, As the face of America continues to change on the brink of the 21st century, ADL will pursue its ever-challenging quest for equality, freedom, and justice for all people. But as Carl Perlston, a former member of the ADL's executive committee, who served in the upper echelons of the ADL for 25 years, asserts, We were a Jewish organization primarily concerned with issues affecting the Jewish community and secondarily with equality and fair enforcement of laws for everyone. I recall that many times in days past we deferred action on an item on the grounds that it was not related to the Jewish community and was thus beyond our purview. In the 1920s, the ADL took on the anti-Jewish discrimination that was prevailing at the time in the employment and housing sectors from the ADL's website. Colleges and medical schools had quotas limiting the admission of Jews. ADL established facts to influence public opinion against job discrimination and quotas in higher education and sought legal remedies. In the 1950s, the ADL joined the struggle for civil rights and filed an amicus curiae brief in the landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education, which put an end to the odious ruling of separate but equal. These are but two of the actions in the name of civil rights the ADL has taken in its history. But the ADL, fighting the anti-Jewish quota system of the 20s, makes only a token effort, if anything at all, to seek legal remedies to help abolish the anti-white quota system called affirmative action. The ADL's official stance on affirmative action is that the ADL is technically against quotas as quotas, yet supports diversity. The ADL also supports the State of Israel the apartheid state of Israel. Why does the ADL fight for integration here in the United States, yet wholeheartedly support the apartheid state of Israel, when a true civil rights organization fight against quotas in general and against apartheid policies wherever they may exist? <laughs> 